and good morning, everybody. Many of you are here today for the Apache Spark uh, project, and some might even know that this is a very special year for Apache Spark. 2020 marks the 10th year anniversary since the project's first release, and to celebrate that, the community put together the uh, Spark 3.0 release, the latest major release of the project. Now today, we see more and more Sparks used as a computation engine to power the lake house architecture. This is to combine the very different kinds of workloads from analytics, BI, streaming, data science, and machine learning. But this was not always the case in the beginning. I remember in 2013, when Spark was a three-year-old project, we started Databricks as a company. At the time, virtually everybody, all of the Spark users, were using Spark's Scala API. Um, and we just added the Python API and the SQL API to the project. Um, because Spark itself was written in Scala, really only Scala was the first class API, and everybody is using it. Now, over the years, we've done a lot more work to make Spark more accessible to data teams, including to data scientists with the Python API and to data analysts with the SQL API. So last week, we took a look at um, the number of commands run on Databricks across all of our customers. And we found something pretty astonishing, especially when compared with the 2013 result. While Scala is still a first-class API and is used by most data engineers to write and build their compute-intensive data engineering jobs, you see the significant rise of Python and SQL, each claiming almost half of all of the commands run on Databricks. This is really the evidence for the Lake House vision, because data scientists use Python, analysts use SQL, while the data engineers are using the JVM-based languages. Every day, Spark users process exabytes of data using SQL on Databricks alone. And this is not just on the Databricks platform. Um, for example, earlier this year, Alibaba um, won the official 100 terabyte TPCDS benchmark using a Spark-based system. And this is sort of the standard benchmark for our data warehousing workloads. But these users don't just use SQL for batch analytics. They are also using them for streaming analytics. Every day, we see over 10 trillion records um, processed on Databricks with structured streaming, which is a streaming project that takes in the SQL uh, query and automatically increment, incrementalize it and streamify it. In June Spark and AI Summit, Matei celebrated Spark's 10-year anniversary and talked about various improvements we make to Spark SQL in the 3.0 release. He talked about the various performance improvements like dynamic partition pruning, adaptive query execution um, that brought significant speed ups anywhere from uh, 2 to 20x to the very specific SQL workloads. But he also talked about the various usability features we added to Spark SQL, like NC SQL compliance, so business analysts can more easily port their SQL workloads over to Spark. In this talk, I would like to focus on a very different aspect, which is the Python. Uh, part of Spark. I would like to talk about Project Zen. Um, we launched this project earlier this year to make Spark more Pythonic. And it includes a collection of features from better API design to better error reporting to better uh, documentation. Matei briefly talked about Project Zen at his uh, summer Spark Summit keynote. Um, I want to give you an update by showing you the progress we have made. Um, some of this are already shipped with Spark 3.0, and some of them are ongoing work. So let's take a preview. The first thing I want to show you um, are user-defined functions, or UDFs. In Spark, it's very common to define a UDF and leverage Spark to distribute the UDF to process large amount of data across the cluster. Because Spark needs to know the type information for all the query plan and UDFs at the compilation time, users must annotate these UDFs uh, with their return types. And before Project Zen, Spark had a specific way of uh, doing annotation. And you can see on the screenshot here. Now, with Project Zen, we're adopting the Python 3 style type hints that's uh, native to Python to annotate this UDF since that. So the code is now not much more clear. But not only that, the users no longer need to learn a special way of annotating this UDF. They can just take whatever they've learned from the Python uh, type hints project over. Next is error messages. And uh, to be honest, it's quite embarrassing for me to show this. PySpark, if you talk to a lot of practitioners, is notorious for its lengthy error messages when something goes wrong. For example, if there's an error in the UDF. Um, it usually shows you a giant stack trace that combines both some Python stack trace and some Scala stack trace. Um, here's an example of an error message on the screen here. Um, you probably can't even tell what uh, had gone wrong. That's because there's actually uh, no, no real error message showing here. It's always showing just very long stack trace. And this is only the first page. Now let's go to the second page. You can see at the top of the second page, 
um, there's a division by zero error, and that is the actual error um, that's been happened uh, that happened on the uh, cluster. And then it's followed by again a very giant JVM stack trace. Um, but that's still not it. Page three. Now you have a different kind of JVM stack trace because this is a JVM stack trace for the um, driver, whereas the previous JVM stack trace is for the executor. They're all internal to Spark. But that's not it. Page four, there's longer stack traces. Page five, and finally, um, the last page. So six pages of very long error messages. This six pages of error, very long error messages have, um, as we talked about earlier, have a very long so Python stack traces internal to Spark, largely, and multiple JVM stack traces also internal to Spark. Um, so you might want to ask, why are we showing all of this? Why don't we just show the division by zero, along with the Python stack traces that's native to the Python project? So that's exactly what we're doing with Project Zen. We're now removing the JVM stack traces that are internal to Spark itself that users have no control over, um, and only displaying the Python stack traces, along with the error at the very end. Um, so it's the very last line, which is what you would see when you're in a console or in a notebook, and now makes the error really easy to spot. We managed to shrink six pages of error messages into just one um, in order to make you more productive. And this is still just a work in progress. In the near future, we hope we can cut this, uh, even the one page error message down even further to show you what the, what's the most critical message you need to see. Now let's talk about autocomplete. Um, I personally rely on autocompletes in IDEs and notebooks every day um, whenever I program. And it's because I simply can't memorize all the different APIs in Spark and in uh, all of the Python ecosystem. Um, I believe that's sort of the case for uh, almost everybody. Before Project Zen, autocompletes for uh, PySpark leave a lot to be desired. Um, it lacks context. It can't show you the most important things. So an example I've shown here it, uh, with a screenshot, you can see um, I'm sort of in the middle of doing a CSV parsing. Um, and most likely, at this particular moment, what I want to see um, is the, uh, the list of different parsing options for CSV files. And you can uh, pretty easily see the suggestions are not that useful. They're mostly generic Python sort of variables and global scope variables that exist. With Project Zen, we're shipping a much better autocomplete that's actually context aware and relevant. Um, and it works in notebooks as well as IDEs. When we take a look at the new screenshot here, you can see now there's very different kinds of uh, CSV parsing options that are directly being suggested um, versus the old one that's mostly Python global variables. As part of Project Zen, um, we have talked about earlier how we can leverage the Python type hints to uh, annotate UDFs. Um, but we have taken one step further and defined type hints for the entire PySpark project itself. Um, as a result, now you can run static type checking across all of the code, including Sparks and your own user defined function. This video on the screen shows you how PyCharm, the, so one of the most popular IDEs for uh, Python, can statically um, analyze the code and tell uh, the developer when the code has errors without even running it, um, which was not possible before without the type hints. This, um, even though it looks like a pretty small convenience feature, it really, this is one of those features that made it possible to scale Python-based Spark development to much larger teams because the type checking, the static um, error checking becomes an implicit con explicit contract between the different development teams working on the same set of projects. The last thing I want to show you as part of Project Zen are docs. Um, the existing Python docs for PySpark can be difficult to navigate. For example, the uh, overall index page I'm showing here is it's very long. It includes a lot of different packages, a lot of different classes. Um, and when you click and go into a specific package, we show you all of the classes um, the contents of all of the methods in one page, which again, is very difficult to navigate. Sometimes you have sort of a, a very long uh, documentation just for one method, and you can't see the other ones. Um, sometimes it's just, uh, it's in a way, information overloading. Project Zen adopts the NumPy style docs to make docs much easier to consume. Um, this is sort of the, how the new doc would look like. It's not finalized yet because it's work in progress. But you can see in the screenshot here, um, we're just listing all of the most important uh, packages with the classes. And we're showing a summary of all of the classes. The so one sentence summary is very concise and easy to understand what they are. And once you click into um, one of the classes, we'll show you all of the methods, again, with one sentence summary for each of the methods. And once you go into a specific method, we have the entire page just for that method itself. And we show you all the details about that method. 
including a more flushed out detailed description with the uh, parameters, the types of parameters, examples. This really makes it much easier to navigate with this clean interface and can make you more productive because now it's easier to look up information. Um, it's also easier to understand what the um, docs are talking about. Of course, we can't talk about making Spark more Pythonic um, at uh, Data and AI Summit, Formula Lauren Spark Summit without talking about Koalas. We launched the Koalas project about a year ago at Spark and AI Summit um, in the summer in San Francisco. Um, Koalas implements the Pandas API over Spark to make it easier for a data scientist to support the existing code over um, to Spark to run on larger amount of data, or to just write new code um, without having to learn a completely new set of APIs like PySpark by just using the Pandas API. It's uh, pretty impressive that in merely one year, we're now seeing more than 850,000 downloads per month of Koalas um, out of PyPy. And uh, in, on top of that, on Databricks, um, our customers are importing um, over 1 million imports of Koala instances each month. So as part of the conference here today, I'm excited to announce Koala's 1.4 release. This release includes a lot of performance improvements and uh, much better API coverage, along with a lot of other usability features to make data scientists more productive. Now, Koala's cover roughly 85% of all of the Pandas APIs. Um, so very likely you can, uh, and it's actually 85% 85, uh, 85 of the most important API. So it's very likely you can just port your Pandas code over with minimum change needed. On Databricks, Koala's pre-installed, so you can just start using it um, without doing anything. Um, outside of Databricks, you can very simply install it with uh, pip or conda, um, which is pip install Koala's, because it's been published to all of the Python re uh, repositories. Rather than showing you more screenshots, Carol will give you a demo of Pythonic Spark with real koalas. So what better way to pass it over to you than throwing you a koala? Carol. Thanks, Ronald. So a lot of you have probably heard by now about our open source project called Koalas, which basically puts a pandas-like interface on top of Spark, which means you could take the single node code that you built to process maybe hundreds or thousands of rows and now easily scale it to millions, billions, trillions, or even more rows using the power of Spark. But you might not have heard about how real life koalas themselves are getting more data driven and they wanna use their new skills to find the best home for their koala babies. And what makes a good home? Good food, of course. So let's see if we can look at some Australian weather data to figure out where in Australia the growing conditions are best for their favorite food, eucalyptus. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is import the libraries I know I'm going to need. And then I'm gonna to wanna to take a look at the weather data that I know we have. And I know it's in a Delta table somewhere. And because I love using pandas, I wanna use koalas to read it in, but I can't quite remember the function for it. So I'm gonna use autocomplete here. And there it is, read underscore Delta. And we can see that that function expects a path of type string. So what we're seeing here is our new support for type hints, which makes it a lot easier to, as you're writing your code, just simply tab over, see what the names of the functions that you need and see the parameters and the types for those parameters that the functions expect. And just go ahead and in this case, enter the string where our Australian weather data lives. All right, now I know this is millions and millions of rows, so I'm just gonna pull the first 10. And while that's loading, Note that type hints works for all of the built-in Spark functions that you see here, any UDFs that you define. You'll be able to access those as well as list the parameters that are expected for any of the functions, etc. Great. And now that our data is populated, let's see what we're working with. So here we have an area code in the leftmost column, which looks like a prefix indicating the Australian state, so VIC for Victoria, WA for Western Australia, and so on, as well as a code that seems to indicate, well, what they're calling area code might correlate with a weather station or something like that. So for each of these area codes, we get hourly data streaming in for a bunch of different weather parameters. This is perfect. It's exactly what I was hoping for because my koala researcher friend has already built a model to estimate the health score for eucalyptus given a few pra uh, weather parameters per region. So I've just copied her function and pasted it here, and we can see that that function expects a series of temperature and a series of precipitation, again, leveraging the new type pin support for UDFs in this case, 
and in return, it'll produce a score in the form of a float, letting us know how likely eucalyptus is to thrive in that area code. Great, so I'll go ahead and register that. And if you haven't seen this before, what we're looking at here is called a pandas UDF. It's also been called a vectorized UDF. And it's basically just a way for you to take your already existing Python functions, drop it into Spark, and define it in such a way that Spark knows how to efficiently and easily distribute that under the hood in a vectorized format. So now that we've done that, we'll go ahead and call it on our entire weather data set. We're going to group it by area code, pass it the temperature and precipitation columns it expects, and now we've sorted it in descending order by score. So we can identify the top five area codes that we might want to explore for our koala babies. So it looks like our top contenders are Queensland QLD 038, New South Wales 158, QLD 50, 221, and NSW 103. So these all look pretty good. But one way to kind of narrow it down is to figure out which of these area codes have the most stable eucalyptus health scores over time. So I prepared some time series data that we can go ahead and use our built-in visualization plot.scatter and koalas to plot. So we can look at all of our eucalyptus scores by month, which is great, that was super easy, but it's not really clear which eucalyptus scores correlate with which area codes. And I don't think there's an easy way to get it all in one graph using matplotlib. So I could either do this um, area code by area code, or I can take advantage of the new backend Plotly support for visualization in koalas. We can just pass the Plotly backend parameter into our scatter plot which is awesome because all of the data scientists and Python users I know love Plotly for how interactive it is. And I know that Plotly also supports passing a column to color code your dots on the scatter plot. So awesome, this worked like a charm. On the right hand side, you can see our legend here, blue for QLD38, red for NSW158, and so on. And it looks like red gave us our highest score, NSW158 in December, of 93.3, but it also looks pretty volatile because it dipped all the way down to 87.9 in March. If we look at blue, on the other hand, it looks like it tends to stay pretty stably above the 90th percentile mark. So I think that's the best choice for our koala babies. And we're going to go ahead and fly them over to Queensland PT038. Here we come. So hopefully this was a fun way to highlight some of the exciting new features that should boost productivity for Python users and data scientists on Spark. Again, including the type hint support, which allows you to use autocomplete and look in line to get an idea of what functions are available to you and what types to pass to those functions. So you don't have to you know, go to multiple screens to figure it out. Again, just allowing you to stay in and keep coding, uh, as well as our support for Plotly, which just gives you a ton more flexibility for interacting with your data. We hope you enjoyed the demo. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Carol, for the great demo. Just to recap this talk, we talk about how Project Zen is making Spark more Pythonic and uh, to make data scientists more productive by giving data scientists better error, um, error messages, better docs, better autocomplete, and uh, better user-defined function with type hints. I don't have time to dive into all the details of Project Zen. And for that, I will encourage you to check out Hugin's talk at this conference. We're seeing Spark used more and more as a compute engine for Lakehouse. Data engineers are using Spark's Scala API to build data pipelines. Data scientists are using Spark's Python API to do statistical modeling and machine learning. And data analysts are using Spark's SQL API for analytics. In the past few years, the community have invested a tremendous amount of energy and effort um, in improving all of these different use cases and the APIs for different personas. And the community will continue to do so. I can't wait to see what you'll be able to do um, with this project.